every year. Uh, so it, it really depends on if people have a high score or a low score, how often we'll do it after that. But it does provide critical information when it's done as an initial screening. I was very excited to see that there is new knowledge in the area of what's really causing the heart attacks. And I know you and Ray talked about vulnerable plaque is the real villain in the story. Can you share a little bit with us about it? Yeah, plaque is the buildup of cholesterol inside of the arteries. <clears throat> and up until recently, most uh, cardiologists regarded the hard plaque, the uh, plaque that's coated with cholesterol. Uh, it's like plaster, uh, and it obstructs arteries to a greater degree than the second kind of plaque known as vulnerable plaque. Vulnerable plaque is soft, it's small, it's hard to see. And in fact, when we do the ultrafast CAT scan, we're actually looking at the hard plaque, which is not the cause of heart disease. However, there is a correlation between hard plaque and soft plaque. If people have no hard plaque, it's unlikely that they have any of the soft or vulnerable plaque, so we don't need to worry. And if they have a lot of hard plaque, then they undoubtedly have a lot of this vulnerable plaque as well. So uh, the steps we can take. The vulnerable plaque is vulnerable to uh, what's called oxidation. Uh, oxidation is a, a chemical process where this cholesterol can be released from the wall of the artery. Uh, it creates an enormous amount of inflammation. This can lead to the formation of a blood clot. And a blood clot, which can obstruct an artery, uh, cuts off the blood flow to the heart and is what we refer to as a heart attack. So we have a combination of this buildup of the soft plaque within the heart arteries and the presence of inflammation, which is a, a, a silent process that goes on within the body that we're also able to detect uh, by this blood test known as the C-reactive protein to determine if people are at risk of developing a heart disease. I noticed that you wrote a lot, too, about inflammation being one of the causal agents in disease. Do you see nanobots as one of the basic ways that we'll be getting rid of inflammation, or do you see free radical scavengers as being the way to get rid of inflammation, or both? Well, both. Uh, and when Ray Kurzweil and I have uh, written our books, both uh, Fantastic Voyage in 2004 and uh, Transcend in 2009, we talk about the three bridges of uh, anti-aging, of longevity. And bridge one is the, the technologies that we have available today. And within that uh, bridge one technologies of today, if we were looking at inflammation, we would look at things like uh, reducing weight because we know that, that fat, the excess fat that we carry around our midsections is actually one of the most potent generators of inflammation within the body. We used to think that fat was just a storage vehicle. It was unsightly. Uh, it increased our risk of diabetes and arthritis and back pain and things like that. But we now realize that fat actually is an organ, uh, an, an endocrine organ. In other words, it secretes hormones. Uh, there are hormones like adiponectin and several other hormones that are secreted by fat. And the more fat that we carry, the more inflammation we have in our body. And inflammation is a chemical process that increases our risk of virtually every major uh, disease. Inflammation is at the root of heart disease. Inflammation is intimately linked with the most common types of cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. Uh, inflammation is linked to Alzheimer's disease and arthritis and diabetes. So to the degree that we're able to reduce inflammation in our bodies, uh, number one, by reducing our excess fat, and then there are other ways that we have inflammation in our body. Uh, probably the second most common source is the inflammation we have in our mouths. Almost everybody has some degree of gum infection, gingivitis. Uh, not enough people uh, use their dental floss regularly, and they develop this uh, silent inflammation of the gums. Well, that inflammation that's in our mouth, the gingivitis, it has an echo effect throughout our bloodstreams and throughout our bodies. And having not flossing regularly is actually a risk factor for cancer and heart disease because it creates inflammation elsewhere in the body. So there are simple steps that we can do like that uh, to reduce the inflammation that we have within our bodies and to reduce our risk of these major killers. You are very much promoted in the book, the stool analysis, the CTS, hair mineral analysis, ultra-fast CT scans. 
I'd like you to talk about the stool analysis and the hair mineral analysis, even though there's so many things that you recommend in the book, because I think that a lot of people assume that the hair analysis is not going to show anything and nobody wants to do a stool analysis. And I really think they should be highlighted by you. Yeah, we try to look at uh, almost everything that comes out of the body. We do blood tests. We do saliva tests, and with the saliva tests, we're looking at uh, levels of cortisol, for instance. We do urine tests. Uh, We do hair tests. Uh, And as you mentioned, we do the the stool test. Uh, The stool test we do to determine how well our our digestive tract is digesting food. So by doing it, no no one enjoys collecting a stool analysis, and honestly, the people in the lab don't enjoy uh, performing the, the tests that we need to work on. But... Nonetheless, we can get some very critical inflammation, information from a stool analysis. Uh, for instance, if we find the presence of lots of fat uh, in the stool, this tells us that our, our digestive process is not very good at breaking down fat. In other words, we may need to improve our digestion. Uh, we may need to, if we find meat fibers or vegetable fibers in the food, uh, we're not breaking down food in the stomach with stomach acid. We're not chewing properly. Uh, we can look at the bacterial uh, content of the stool. Uh, it appears that the most common cell type in the human body, and this is something that actually the majority of physicians in practice don't know, but the most common cell type in the body is not our muscle cells, it's not our bone cells, it's not our fat cells. It's actually the bacterial cells living in our colon, which are then shed in the stool. So by doing a stool analysis, we can see what type of bacteria are growing. Do we have overgrowth of abnormal bacteria, which almost everybody does? And the reason we get this overgrowth of abnormal bacteria is because uh, typically the, the, much of the food we eat, uh, most of the conventionally uh, grown meat products, beef and chicken, uh, eggs, dairy, uh, they, give, uh, they keep the animals in enclosed areas. Uh, which are not healthful, and as a result, they need to give these animals large quantities of antibiotics to keep them from getting sick from these enclosed conditions. The, antibody, the antibiotics uh, end up in the meat and the chicken and the eggs and the milk, uh, and those travel into our digestive tracts when we eat these type of foods, and those antibiotics will kill the bacteria, the, the normal healthy bacteria that's typically found within the, the colon, and then we get overgrowth of yeast and some other types of abnormal bacteria. So we can find a wealth of information with a stool analysis. Uh, As far as hair goes, uh, hair can tell us what's circulating in the bloodstream because over a long period of time. So, for instance, if we find uh, the presence of large amounts of calcium, magnesium, and strontium in the hair, those are the three biggest bone minerals. And very commonly in uh, postmenopausal women, we will do a hair analysis and we'll find a large amounts of these three minerals uh, in the hair, in which case we know that this woman is turning over her her bone and we need to be more aggressive uh, with uh, uh, preventing osteopenia and osteoporosis in this woman. Uh, We can also notice the presence of toxins in the hair, particularly heavy metals like arsenic and mercury and lead and aluminum. So by doing a hair analysis, uh, we have a simple, inexpensive, and non-invasive way of uh, getting a snapshot of many different uh, factors inside the body. You went pretty thoroughly into your perspectives on hormone and hormone replacement, which was pretty much up to speed with what I've understood about the anti-aging perspective, which is balancing the hormones, testing the hormones, not just winging it. How long do you think it will take for doctors to catch up to where you are? in terms of the way they look at it. I know that anti-aging research and the A4M has been around for over 10 years and a lot more doctors are coming up to speed. But given Ray's analogy of the exponential rate at which things are going to change and maybe knowledge will be known, what's your take on it before some of this becomes common knowledge? Well, just as we discussed with the use of the, the coronary artery calcium score for heart disease, It's been available for 15 years, and only now are a a relatively small number of cardiologists beginning to recommend it, but it's becoming more and more widespread. The same thing's going on with uh, hormone therapy. Until about, uh, say, 
uh, it was about 2004, uh, the women's 